Today's video is being brought to you with help from G Fuel, one of the most popular energy supplements on the market, known for providing fuel for the focus of a new generation of gamers, creators, students, and athletes. Made with top tier ingredients, their sugar free formulas give you the energy, focus, and endurance you need to power through your daily tasks. And if you are interested in getting your hands on some, either to try it out for the first time and see if it's right for you, or to resupply your favorite flavor and are looking for a bit of a discount, please use the code DSIEGE and get 20% off your next purchase, while at the same time supporting this channel and helping me continue to create the content you've all come to enjoy. I'll leave a link in the description below if you're interested, and thank you in advance for any who choose to purchase using my code. I very much appreciate your support. Without further ado, on to the feature presentation. Arthur? Tenno. Mm. Forgive me. I need Lloyd to understand why I had to leave without him. Why I forced him to destroy the device after I had gone. And why I could never say the words he so needed to hear. If I had remained in the Deimos laboratory, Lloyd would never have been safe from him. You know of what I speak. And so I retreated to the only place in history where that entity could not easily follow. To draw his greedy eye away from Lloyd. Tenno, I require your trust. Craft the little curio whose blueprints you will find in the computer's memory. Complete the Kalimos sequence. Repair. Rebuild. When the time is right, find me. Hey all, Siege here and today. Today I want to talk about the monster we encountered during the Whispers in the Wall quest. And no, I'm not referring to the man in the wall. For those of you who have taken the time to battle the Whispers found in the derelict pages of Entrati's grimoire and are privy to the information found within his lost notes, you may already realize that perhaps the greater monster, even than the indifference, is Entrati himself. The question we'll go over in this video, which will be up for you to decide at the end, is which of them is worse, and are we even on the right side? Now, most of you already know the dangers presented by the Man in the Wall, especially when considering the Whispers in the Wall quest. Any shred of innocence or well-intentioned mayhem that he may have been perceived to have dried up pretty quickly, I'd say, with the ending portraying him as none too happy with our actions. But now, it's time to discuss our dear Albrecht. When we are first introduced to Entrati, I think the argument could be made that he is portrayed as being quite timid, unsure of himself, desperate even, especially when considering the requiems by which his voice is first heard. And this sentiment is then buoyed by a particularly tender cutscene during the opening of the Whispers in the Wall quest, continuing to the end where his final thoughts to his trusted servant become known. However, after addressing the information we learn in his aforementioned lost notes, accessed after having to literally fight the pages for their knowledge, akin in many ways to a horcrux from the Harry Potter franchise, we come to learn he has another side to him as well. After his initial encounter with the man in the wall, he really does become the essential embodiment of Carl Jung's consumed shadow, essentially throwing caution and the rest of humanity as well as what's left of his own to the wind in order to right the perceived wrong of manifesting the man in the wall within our existence. In the first of these notes, he speaks of his predicament, detailing the immediate aftermath of his initial encounter, where we learn of his recovery and subsequent rededication of where his life's work needed to be, at least from his perspective. I uh, wanted nothing but the ease of oblivion at first. I floated ignorant in Baz of Nepenthe, a second gestation. On seeing, on speaking, only rarely did my brain flicker 
errant light across the cave paintings is still smeared on the interior of my skull. At sensation's edge, I knew a vague silhouette of Lloyd crooning motherly across the watery distances. The poetry my tongue was too blackened to recite. Too craven to chase death, I awaited it. The father of fears, and yet I was still afraid. The currents whispered, coward. I clenched my body into a fist as a fetus must and blinded myself afresh. Stark pain smoked the juice of my living tomb. Why did the saga not end by itself? Why must I still act? Steeped in solitude, I found I could no longer endure my own company. Disgust did the work of courage. I tore the mundane membrane, slid weak and mucosal into Lloyd's embrace. Lloyd nursed me then, tending first to the uprooted ruin of my eyes, then to the mouth whose grin no longer hid behind flesh. The agony bit deep, but it was clean. Blameless love bled up from me. I had decided to live. I felt no certainty as I donned clothes rough and strange to the touch of new-grown skin. I had none of the selfless zeal of the soldier. The same cursed question still pursued me as it had before. Was I, even now, trapped in the rictus of the wall? The apparatus of logic would never yield an answer. Only resolute action remained. If I must be a demon, let me be an honest one. Let me prove my nature by what I do next. Purpose. Let me leave such blazing footprints behind me as no unclean thing would dare to walk in. For all of you questioning his new look, well, you can attribute that as well to the Void Entity, even changing his physical appearance in order to reinforce his rebirth. Further, we come to find his initial encounter with the Wall had really done a number on him, burning his skin, blinding his eyes, and almost entirely removing the lower portion of his face, with Lloyd being the one to carefully rebuild his body. However, the most important aspect of this first section of his notes has to be in relation to his position on the indifference. Namely, that he still cannot be sure if it's just another entity or one that resides within him as well. This fear turns him fully, believing there no true way to know if this entity was not forever a part of his consciousness and deciding that only in action would he be able to establish a true legacy for the man known as Albert Entrotti. This at first appears to be a noble endeavor, but Many times crusades of this nature allow for the slow decay of morality, believing the concept to be so important that other previously held rules and beliefs are allowed to be bent, or even broken, should they be in contrast to this new prime directive. The idea or ideology becomes their new identity. And in the case of Entrati, this new purpose would in fact do just that, starting with his use of Kavya. I employed a variety of caveat in an attempt to unmake the adversary. The principle was straightforward enough. 
though in hindsight I abhor my naivete. My humanity had been unscrolled by the caustic void and now smirked back at me across the divide, privy to all my unfettered malice and pettiness. In answer, I resolved to hurl into the void minds that were not human. Let it parody them. The proximity of the bestial would force a humbling devolution. Or so I thought. The majority of the caviar merely died. I gave the void living beings and it sent me back bedraggled cadavers. The dead lay stacked in pyramids around my deserted lab. I was nothing but a failed priest. But a glass splinter of stubbornness still stuck in me, and so I persisted. The correct combination of creatures would work. I realized my error as I sweated by visionary Nesta Wood Cinders, beside Lloyd, who curled pale and sick from chewing too much of the root. The catalyst was uniqueness. That attribute was what caught the interest of the bland and undifferentiated void. It was not necessary to explore queasy debates about the Oro. Animal minds simply lacked the full distinction of a singular persona. My Kalimos, I was sure, was an exception, but I would not sacrifice that loyal being. Perhaps I should have. The sin I was to commit was worse. The very last breeding pair of servulites was smuggled to me, causing Lloyd no small inconvenience. A species on the brink of extinction. Here was the uniqueness the Void sought. I was certain to the pit of my entrails. I loaded the pair onto their Sereglas bridal barge, along with an expendable avian and a norg for mental ballast. Fish, fowl, and beast. A facile equilibrium. They did not die, save one. They came back changed. Witnesses, pilgrims even, chanting freakish praise to the one beyond the wall. I knew then that my gambit had lost. So long as I worked through scapegoats, my guilt would only deepen. I must atone for what I had done through my own blood. Standard laboratory hygiene would have been to dispose of them, but some instinct stayed my hand. The void tongue was an enigma to me, but another, more habituated to the void than I, might one day unravel it. Through the imposition of form upon the formless, they could perhaps glean some meaning. I assigned the caviar to Lloyd, for I could not bear to look upon them. Not yet. Lloyd is at heart a good and kind man, better than I deserve, and completely oblivious to his own true worth. The caveat, the animals that eventually act as vendors within the Sanctum Anatomicum, are quite the anomaly right from the beginning of the quest. Mumbling in the same void tongue whose meaning still eludes us, are to Entrati at least, nothing more than cattle. Lambs to the slaughter, if you will. The avian and the norg are portrayed as especially worthless, essentially just companions alongside the serbulite pair for some level of balance entities he determined to be the correct ilk for his theory. And the theory in question centers around uniqueness. Now with this newfound inspiration, he decided to attempt to counter the Void Presence, hoping to trick it into making dangerous decisions because of its perceived naivety. This was done by utilizing the caveat as, well, essentially sacrifices. Guinea pigs, as their naming convention suggests to the man of the wall, in the hope that it would mimic them and lose a measure of its intelligence. 
these simple creatures dumbing it down, for lack of a better word. This turns out incredibly badly, with the vast majority of them being returned from the void as limp, expired bodies. He believed that the indifference was looking for creatures that were in direct contrast to the mundane or ordinary, which to me is the first indication of Ventrati's issues. We don't necessarily know if this is in fact the case, and even if it is, it doesn't necessarily mean that it was that way for Entrati himself, as his first venture in the void happened more by accident than anything else. So it's quite possible his conceited nature is actually showing itself within his own scientific theories, especially when we come to find that the one Kavya who was taken, Min, was more likely lost due to the actions of the newly sentient Fibonacci versus a specific choice from the Man of the Wall, depicted in the story we get from these animals for ranking up their syndicate. Stop him! Stop him! Anyone! He's lost his mind! Oh, I can't! Help oh, the boy! He's killed me! Stop! Stop! I'm leaking! I'm leaking! You're fine. What in blazes? What the hell do you care? You put us in that bell. You watched as she- I saved your lives! Do you really think Albrecht thought to freeze you? To preserve you? That was me! In the hope that we might find a cure for... For void... Exposure... Then... That... Means... The clock's still ticking. We're gonna die. I'm... I'm working on it. I don't care. I want the fish. What? He did it! He killed her! He killed Min! What? I just told you that you're going to... Hold on a minute. This specimen... Min was lost to the void. Vented to the void by him. Why would... To save himself, or so the coward thought. Tell them, tell them what you did. The void had penetrated the bell. It was in there with us. Before it started talking though, it made us smart enough to understand it. And that's when Fibonacci here lost his shit. Panicked. Tried to get it out by blowing the seal. Min was closest when it popped. After the monitors failed, Albrecht wondered how you all came to be exposed to that degree. Fibonacci? His name isn't Fibonacci. Of the four of us, he's the only one without a name. Aren't you? Mate, weren't even part of the group. Didn't even get a label. A late addition is all he was. An afterthought. A fish. Why name something too stupid to hold a memory for longer than 15 seconds? I want to hear what- He's killed me! You killed us! All of us! Papa. Forever kissing the fist that beats you. Papa? Papa is a stinking liar. Men and I were the last Surfalites. But Albrecht didn't see our species as having worth. 
We were just one more component in one more experiment. And Papa didn't think much of the results. So, tag for disposal. That was us. Both of us were tag for. But I won't let her go on with that. I gave her something better. She's men. We were never meant to be here. We only ever had each other. And now, not even that. Papa? Papa? Spineless, void, damned Albrecht. I want to find him as bad as you do. <sighs> and you'll know when I do. Because his head's going right in your stinking tank. I... <sighs> I never meant to. I... Lloyd. You can't imagine what it was like to suddenly exist is horror enough, but to suddenly exist, to comprehend so much, only to be faced with extinction. I... I'm sorry. Walk, 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 walk. We'll get into the full story of the caveat in another video, as it definitely deserves its own analysis. But as we can see, it's not clear whether or not his hypothesis on how the man is choosing is accurate. But I believe it to be an important point to keep in mind, as, well, it may answer another lingering question regarding the Zerman 10 Zero. Now, by crafting Entrati's Curio, it changes the caveat's significance, at least to the Tenno, as these animals become the catalyst for unraveling what the man on the wall has planned, offering the Tenno considerable insight into what they are dealing with, and more importantly, what's needed in order to do so. Now, did Entrati mean for all these things to occur? Could any or all of it be attributed to dumb luck? Or are we potentially being led into a trap? According to Entrati, the Cavia chanted freakish praise to the indifference once returned from the void, and in the case of Tagfer in particular, it would seem he is more on the side of the man on the wall than anything else, as his only real reason to help us is to locate Entrati for, let's say, less than benevolent purposes. Overall, the Sanctum Anatomica is not a friendly place for the Tenno, regardless of how it's presented to us. The walls are continually speaking and watching us. Further, effigies of the man on the wall can be seen from every corner, literally part of the architecture in conjunction with an absurd number of fingers. If Fibonacci is to be believed, As long as the indifference is missing a digit, it is confined to the strands of craw. Don't ask you, your tiny mind would likely pop under the strain of understanding. This limitation is our one hope. This imagery may be in mockery of the Indifference's desire to reclaim its missing body parts, although it's not quite clear who made this place or how it was built, so is it Entrati mocking him, or vice versa? While it appears as though the faces we see architecturally in nature are not necessarily part of the man on the wall, by looking underneath the sanctum, just past the ringing beeper, we can absolutely make out the silhouette of what most perceived to be the Indifference's prime form, the Vitruvian pose through the clouds below, solidifying the idea that we're probably not too safe here and are more likely sitting at the front lines of this cosmic war. And it would appear its beginnings were rooted in Duviri. In Duviri, I woke every day to the voice of my daughter. I recoiled from this at first, feeling the sting of conscience. I could not confront, even in semblance, the woman I had abandoned. Instead, I reinvented myself as a teacher, advising the Child King of the menace beyond his borders. But as the days melted away, 
I came to recognize the strange cast of characters Yuliria had created and their purpose. I heard voices I had myself first conjured in the darkness of her childhood chambers for no other reward than her delight. She had not only preserved this gift I had thought so trivial, she had made it an instrument of healing. More, a stronghold. Despite my legacy of neglect, despite my shoddy example, my needs, my demands, my daughter had triumphed in my absence. Her confidence, her warmth, shamed me. I had fled from the horror, but she... She had stood alongside the most vulnerable, those with the most to lose, and told them a different story. I did not perceive the significance of Euleria's stance at first. Her concern for the children was not merely pastoral attentiveness. It was a direct strike against the indifference. She was teaching the weak to be strong in the very places where those cold fingers would reach and through her act of compassion, spitting in the face of alienation and despair. Could I do less? Shame is an inert state, but fertile. It primes the mind, bolstering it for repentance. I had thought to make a difference in Duviri, but Duviri had made a difference in me. My own daughter's creations, reverberating and growing in the womb of the void, had shown me another path than that of the indulgent coward. I was neither helpless nor irredeemable. Like she had, I could fight. I took inspiration from Euleria's example. To the people of Duveri, I bequeathed a legacy of cautionary stories. In them, I spoke of fears that an infinity of spirals would not, could not erase. I slipped away from those lands, silent and unnoticed, from their joys their sadnesses, from the celebration in my honor. In her, they already had all they needed. My work, I now understood, must proceed from a different point. I would confront the phantom of myself and deny it to the teeth. Anyone who followed the lore prior to now assumed that Entrati was in Duveri, but this passage actually confirms it. More importantly though, I think it contradicts something many believed before, that Duveri was the Tenno's creation. From what we are told here, it would seem more likely that this area was created by Euleria. And this actually makes sense given that there was a time in Duveri before the child came to Thrax. A question we have yet to answer remains then in how did he and our drifter make it here? Regardless, we are shown an Entrati who appears to want to portray himself in a positive light, a teacher and a protector, but as even he remarks, at what cost? The vessels, the former sick humans during the Great Plague, of which is referenced on the Meyer Sword, were offered healing from the good doctor, but that wasn't the real reason he had traveled back in time to this particular moment. I went among the denizens of the plague year like a savior, my hands filled with healing. To those who volunteered, I brought more than mere health. Their bodies were primed. It needed only the Helminth infusions brought from my own time to work the alchemy of transformation. They have become partial warframes. Still in possession of their free will, yet enhanced, void attuned, capable. Their humanity may not last. My deliverance may yet consume them. The human swallowed up in the sacred beast. 
And if my wayward disciples turn on me, what words of comfort shall I have beyond? This is the bargain we have made. Through our sacrifice, history will be saved. As their loyal doctor, I have taken repeated samples from them. The sight of their technocyte-riddled cells mutating gave me fresh visions. I could take this material, work with it, forge new creations. Eagerly, I brought the samples back to Deimos and began to cultivate them. It was Lloyd who pointed out the singular attributes of the Grey strain, how it stimulates growth to monstrous dimensions. Many thoughts converged in me then. What if, through precise biochemical engineering, I could create the equivalence of warframes yet built to a titanic scale? Surely such a legion could stand against the adversary? Assuming, of course, that an operator could be found, not long after, the first of my vessels took form. A giant to battle giants, merging the humanity of the man Arthur, the anatomical perfection of Ballas's warframes, and the titanic potency of the Grey Strain. My saviors. Desperate people are much more open to experimental remedies, and what better group of people than those stricken with the plague? By utilizing both the helmet strain, the one typically administered to Ballas' warframes, and the treasure of Deimos, the gray strain, the one responsible for the increased physical size of the creatures found there, he was able to create the massive humanoids we find around the lab. Given what we see during the Whispers in the Wall quest, it's safe to assume that these two, at least, don't necessarily hold Entrati in high regard, and I think this may mean that he wasn't exactly forthcoming with all of what was included in being part of this experiment, the results of which are strewn all over his lab. And it doesn't look too great. These people are more machine than anything else now, with their arms, legs, eyes, and even heart removed. In this one here, we have a brain, and I think most disturbing is that some of them seem to still be alive. Hearts beating. Eyes glazed over. Did they agree to all this? Further, what happened to Arthur in the aftermath of all of it? Prior to us transferring into his body during the quest, his eyes still register, but afterwards, they're gone. Does this fate befall all who undergo transference? And if so, where does their consciousness go? And further, does Entrati even care? Well, his final entry answers this question pretty distinctly. All is in readiness. Lloyd will do as he is bid. Though his eyes silently plead with me to choose another path. As I await my final crossing to the past, I ponder what role a scientist may play in so spiritual a matter as absolution. How in the alchemy of the soul even repentance must necessarily be a calculated task. I will repair what I have broken, no more no less. The scales must balance, and in such a monstrous penitence as this, I shall take no heed of the dust that may fall upon them on either side. The dust of petty lives. The builders of old tempered their mortar with blood to appease the most ancient of land spirits. We should have been so wise, yet it is not too late to learn. The sands fall, the circuit completes, I return to the place of the beginning. Let witless hordes bleat their disdain for every fervent plan. The deal is done, the die is cast. I end as I began. Now, given what we learned during the new war, it's starting to look like the true mission of the Zeraman 10 Zero was an offering to the void for the purpose of finding uniqueness. 
After all, a vessel with this many humans was bound to catch the eye of the indifference, with Arteno appearing to be the one due to whatever light those around us seem to see. This would explain how such an untested move was considered when this vessel was supposed to be the future of the Orican race, a move that the majority of the crew were not in agreement with. They all knew a big jump was coming. Not a safe, controlled sequence of bursts, but a single mad leap. So the people found a thousand ways to say no. And I denounced them as filthy traitors. You had no choice. Eternalism dictates that we always have choices. They believed me and now they're dead. As well as how a Tenno child, originally meant to help colonize a new world, would turn out to be the one to fulfill Entrati's operator prophecy. Given the extreme things the Holdfasts were guilty of, I think it can even be surmised that the inclusion of these specific people was done on purpose, precisely because of how loose their morals were. And even the executor, most associated with the mission as its sponsor, Tuval, abandons the entirety of the ship almost immediately as soon as things go wrong. We stretched forth our great hands our generosity and we gave such abundance you citizens were to be the first to settle a new system and now your bestial defiance has cast you into the pit come to those hands again and you will find them closed to you now, do these seem like the actions of a group of people interested in the well-being of a supposed colony set to save their entire race? Or do the denizens of the Zeremen appear more and more like Kavia themselves? In the end, Entrati got what he wanted. An operator capable of everything he apparently needed in order to fight the indifference as he sees fit. Only now are we beginning to see what the cost of all this actually is. And I'm no longer certain it's a coincidence that the gray strain infected the Entrati family on Deimos. Suppressing memories appears to be the only way to keep the indifference from those he holds dear. And the end of Whispers shows that somehow Lloyd forgot this moment, or else he wouldn't have needed the grimoire to remember. We see Entrati specifically talking to him during the opening scene, and those same words turn out to be what the grimoire uncovers. So is it such a crazy concept to think that the same was done to the rest of the family, being blamed on the son instead? If nothing else, it's an awfully convenient effect. And consider the cost to Arteno. They've lost their family, friends, really everything they knew once the Zeremen made the ill-fortuned, what was it, mad leap into the void. In fact, if I really think about it, the only person who hasn't really lost much, who hasn't seemed to have to spill his own blood or do really anything now that he exists in the past, is Entrati himself. The plague denizens, the countless Cavia, his own immediate family, and Lloyd as well, the people of Duviri, all except his precious Kavat Kalimus, that even he suspects would have fit his theory, but is just too important to risk. Aside from that animal, the rest are all left to fend for themselves, unless the Tenno do something about it, of course. As much as it's portrayed that Entrati is being heroic in nature, in reality, he's still exactly who he claimed to be, the father of fears. A coward, smart enough to actually grasp both what he has done to the system, as well as how dangerous it actually is, placing the entirety of the systems and perhaps the universe's survival in the hands of children. I think a really obvious pop culture connection can be made here, at least on the surface to that of Rick from Rick and Morty, a scientist with infinite amounts of knowledge who can build anything, go to any time or dimension, or just bend existence to his or her whim, and essentially making them a kind of god of sorts in the process. But Rick is more akin to the man on the wall, infinitely confident and seemingly still indifferent to whatever he does. 
even to the actions of the Tenno. But that part's starting to crack. Whereas in Trotty, well, if we're using the Rick and Morty referencing, would be more in line with Morty. Timid, unsure of himself, with his best only coming out in dire circumstances, and even then the results can be less than perfect. This is why I'm not necessarily on board with the idea of Entrati being a good character in the Warframe universe. It's entirely possible that he means to sacrifice the Tenno just as quickly as any of the Kavya, or those infected during the plague, or even his own kin if he believed it necessary to achieve his final goal. So whereas I'm certainly not advocating for a team up with our doppelganger, I am stressing that it's more than likely that the Tenno aren't necessarily supposed to survive this war. The light that we exhibit will most likely be the determining factor on whether or not the Tenno make it through in the end, although you can almost guarantee that aspect won't be found in any of Entrati's formulas scratched over every corner of his lab. With that being said, I hope you all enjoyed this first look into what the Whispers in the Wall quest will uncover about the greater lore of the game. Who is the real monster during the Whispers in the Walls? Is it the Indifference, or is it Entrati himself? I believe I've made my initial case for the one I believe. I'll be curious to hear what you think in the comments. I really do think this puts the Tenno's future in a much different light, and the Zeraman will never look the same to me again. It's one thing to be an accident. It's an entirely different thing if the people on that ship were nothing more than Kavia to begin with. In the end, one can only see so many similarities and question whether coincidence had a part in any of it. And there certainly are a ton of similarities here. Are the Tenno just another caveat in the mind of Entrati? Or are they more significant? I suppose we'll find out. At any rate, I hope you all have a wonderful day today, wonderful rest of your week, and I'll talk at you all soon. Take care, everybody. Bye.